Cole just said to start now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Good morning to everyone. Uh, we are honored here today to have four illustrious uh, panelists uh, who are doing great things in computing and computer science education. Um, it is my distinct and great pleasure to have Dr. Tamara Pearson, Ernest Holmes, Dr. Kenneth Gaucher, and JC Holmes as well uh, on this panel to talk about uh, identity and the HBCU experience in computer science. My name is Chad Womack. I am the Senior Director for STEM Programs and Initiatives at the UNCF. I am a very proud Morehouse College and Morehouse School of Medicine graduate. Uh, I am like the atheist in the holy city. I'm the one panel, uh, person on this panel that knows very little about computer science and uh, over the years have been uh, blessed to have had Dr. Kenneth Gaucher and Ernest as my, my mentors in uh, navigating the world of computer science. But having said that, I am a scientist and I'm deeply concerned about the state of African Americans in computer science and this panel's going to focus on the role of HBCUs in identity formation for students who are pursuing computing and computer science. I'll let the panelists uh, introduce themselves in terms of their titles. Uh, but Dr. Pearson's at Spelman College. Ernest is a graduate of Morehouse College, who's now a uh, software engineer at Google. Dr. Kenneth Gaucher is a professor at Morehouse College, and JC is both a Spelman graduate uh, as well as a professor at, like Dr. Pearson at um, Spelman College. So without further ado, Dr. Pearson, you wanna introduce yourself and your title. Sure, and I have to say, I am also a, a graduate of Spelman College as Thank well. Thank you, I'm sorry about that, I missed that, sorry. AUC in the house. Two Spelman <laughs> graduates. <laughs> um, so yes, I'm Tamara Pearson. I am the director of Spelman College's Center of Excellence for Minority Women in STEM and I'm happy to be here. Excellent. Ernest? Like uh, Dr. Womack said, I am a 2019 of Morehouse College. I am part of that debt-free class. I got their debt paid off by Robert Smith. I've interned at Google for three summers, so since my freshman year, worked full-time as a software engineer at Google on the Fuchsia team, working on the drivers part of that. We don't need to go into that at all. But I'm also the president and co-founder of Codehouse, which is a uh, 501c3 nonprofit that's focused on bringing students of color um, into the tech industry and supporting them along their journeys. Happy to be here. Excellent. JC? Uh, if you're noticing a similar last name between Ernest and myself, that is not a coincidence. That is my little brother right there. I am a Spelman 2016 graduate, uh, as well as the current uh, faculty member in arts and visual culture, where I am currently writing a new major and minor for Spelman College called Interactive Media that looks at the intersection of art and computer science. I am also the co-director for the Spelman Innovation Lab. Uh, before that, I was a product manager at Microsoft for two years. Uh, I'm also a graduate of NYU Tisch School of the Arts, where I received a master's in uh, computer science and design. And I am also the director of curriculum and instruction at Codehouse, the nonprofit that I run with my brother. Well, wow, that's a hard act to follow, but we'll try. <laughs> Dr. Kenneth Gaucher. Putting a lot of pressure on me. Um, <laughs> Gaucher, I am a, um, I'm the Chenault Division Chair at Morehouse College, uh, tenured in computer science, been at the college. This is my um, I think it's about to be my 10th year at Morehouse. Um, they do a lot of CS outreach work in the um, Atlanta area, um, at Alabama area actually as well, doing some things there. Uh, COVID has allowed me to do some, uh, expand my outreach uh, a little farther than the city. Originally from Phoenix City, Alabama, uh, Albany State alum. I'm the only, I'm the only not AUC alum, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> But I'm happy to be here to talk to everybody. Well, we're happy that you're here. And thank you, everyone, for introducing yourselves and providing a little bit about your background. Um, we have a couple questions that we uh, want to pose uh, to the panelists. And uh, want to kick it off um, by, by talking about 
um, why HBCUs are important in terms of, and what role uh, can or should HBCUs play in identity formation around uh, African Americans pursuing degrees and careers in computing and computer science. And uh, we're all uh, in the AUC family, so, uh, but this is meant to be also uh, more broadly speaking, uh, applicable to all the other HBCUs as well. So, um, uh, Dr. Pearson, why don't you kick it off and, and give us your thoughts on that question? I would love to. So, you know, as a proud graduate of the number one HBCU in the country for the 14th year in a row, and the number one producer of Black women who go on to get PhDs in STEM, I feel like that second accolade speaks to why HBCUs, right? Like Spelman College only has you know, a little less than 2,000 students, but for us to be able to continuously produce the number one amount of students who go on to get PhDs, or Black women who go on to get PhDs in STEM is outstanding, right? We are extremely small, but we are still able to produce the largest returns on investment. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and that's, you know, the next school underneath that is Howard University, right? So it's like, if, if HBCUs aren't here, who is producing? The people that go on to, you know, make these great accomplishments in computer science or in any STEM field. So, you know, I was listening to the keynote earlier and he was talking about when you're talking about equity, you have to talk about it on the interpersonal right level and you also have to talk about it on the systemic level. And I feel like HBCUs really are able to tackle that interpersonal level, right? We're able to create students who have strong identities so that they can then go out into the world and tackle the systemic level. Um, so that's kind of my opinion of why HBCUs. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, JC, why don't you add uh, your two cents to that? Why, why HBCUs are critical and what is it unique about the HBCU experience that helps identity formation for African Americans? I think I speak for my brother and myself that I don't know where Ernest and I would be if it wasn't for the communities that supported us at HBCUs. You know, being a student at an HBCU, I received a family, of mentors and colleagues and peers, my academic matriculation with. Uh, when I first got to uh, my HBCU, I had never before explored computer science or even really STEM subjects. Mm -hmm. I didn't have that foundation uh, in high school that I felt was supporting me through my academic matriculation. I didn't think of myself as a person who could major in computer science or mathematics. I had never taken a computer science class until I got to Spelman College, right? And the reason why I took my first computer science class, there's two parts to that. One, I had a class me. Her name was Maya Havard. She lived right next door to me in LLC1. Uh, and she was taking computer science class and she loved it. And she was like, this is something that you might want to consider. She knew she wanted to major in math. And that was the first time that I had met another black woman who wanted to major in STEM. And she was taking her computer science class. And eventually she would go on to double major in math and computer science while also being the student trustee of Spelman. So we're very proud of Maya. Uh, but she was the first person that I had met that knew that that was a possibility for her. And so I told her I would consider it. And then while I was in my first semester, my brother called me up. He was at the time. I'm a junior in high school, and he told me I am taking a computer science class from uh, in high school taught by the only black woman who had ever taught in our school district that we knew of at the time. She was the first one. She came in just during my senior year. I did not get to meet her until afterwards. But Ernest was so excited and so empowered and motivated by this teacher that him being a very quiet junior uh, in high school called up his sister so excited about this class he was taking, encouraging me to take my first computer science class. So between the two of them, I took my first computer science class in the, my spring semester of my freshman year. And I fell in love. I was graduating college. I was actually trying to do it in three years. So I didn't have time to major in computer science. But because of the encouragement that I had from my classmate and my brother, uh, as well as the encouragement I had from my peers in that class, as well as my teacher at the time, who was Dr. Jaquita Thomas, uh, I fell in love with computer science. For the longest time, I didn't know 
that there were other people besides black women in this space of computer science. All my professors were black women, my classmates were black women, all the computer scientists I could name were black women. Uh, and so it wasn't until I got to industry that I actually encountered the real diversity issue that exists in STEM. But I would never have been so encouraged and so welcomed into my computer science community had it not been for uh, my enrollment at Spelman College and my time at Spelman College. Uh, and so I know this is anecdotal, but for me, the power that comes in representation and in community is what makes HBCU so special. Well, that's, that's excellent. And why don't we go to the little brother who's uh, working at a big company called Google. Um, yeah. Uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts, Ernest, about <clears throat> um, specifically um, identity uh, as it relates to being African American, you're a software engineer, uh, level three, correct at Google? Yep. And, yep. and um, which is which is pretty outstanding for you to have been able to get to that level fairly quickly. But what what is it? What has it meant for you uh, as a, as a black man in tech, coming from um, an HBCU, Morehouse College? How has that uh, impacted your experience? Yeah. Um... I think it's, you know, there's no secret that there's a diversity issue as it relates to race in the tech in industry, right? Um, all these big companies, my company included, 3% are less black. Um, and it's almost as if, as if someone, maybe from the UNCF, maybe from other organizations, whispered to them a few years ago, like, there's these things called HBCUs and you can go and recruit um, top tier black talent at these institutions. <clears throat> And there's like almost a renaissance of like all these companies magically finding out about HBCU so they can re recruit um, talent. And I always tell students now, like, if you leave an institution like Morehouse, like Howard, like Spelman, like Clark, without two, three, four offers, then you, didn't, you just didn't try, you know, because they're there. They're, the door is open. You need to go ahead and be proactive to um, take those opportunities. Like, I was fortunate enough to get the internship my freshman year, continue on at Google for two more years. Um, but I left Morehouse with six six figure offers because all these companies came to um, Morehouse to try to recruit students that look like me um, with my skill set. And I think one of the big misconceptions when students in high school are considering HBCUs is that they don't prepare them for the real world, right? Um, like, how can you deal with white and other ethnicity co-workers when you you're um surrounded by an environment full of black people your entire four years uh at a morehouse for instance right and that is like so 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 far from the truth like if anything i learned at morehouse that i need to work twice as hard twice as smart twice as fast so i can make sure that i whatever goals i set out i like i achieve them and i make sure i get them um efficiently and like, and I, I think that's a true testament with the internships I did because every year, like I'll look left and look right at Google and the students from MIT, from Stanford, from Carnegie Mellon would not be there their following years, you know? And I'm like, and sure some of them went to different companies, but I know some of them just didn't get return offers. Um, yeah. But that's because uh, at Morehouse, I was taught how I need to communicate, not only just communicate professionally, but also with my technical skills so that I can make sure to uh, persevere through the internships to get return offers, you know, and that those same skill sets are, are helping me um, be very productive and efficient with my full-time job to this very day. Uh, so I just think the skills that, that Morehouse and HBCUs teach you just truly, truly carry over in the um, real world in such a huge way and really, I, th I think it like took a lot of my skills that I, I started developing through like high school and through like lessons or with my sister and my parents um, and really like exponentially grew them um, at Morehouse. They truly cultivated me to be able to be the, the best of my ability at, at, at Morehouse. So um, I guess my biggest takeaway from going to HBCU is that the opportunities are there. There's mm -hmm. people there to help you. Like you said, the community there is amazing. You know, I got to meet all y'all pretty much at, at while going to Morehouse and you guys all helped me along with my journey. So um, there's really no reason like if you do go to HBCU that you don't come out pursuing uh, or getting offers from major organizations just like Google. Yeah, thank you, Ernest. I appreciate those insights. Uh, Dr. Gaucher, uh, as a faculty member, what's your perspective on how HBCUs uh, like the AUC and others shape 
one's identity in computing. Because you've seen now cohorts of students come and come through Morehouse and through the AUC, and you've you've touched the lives of many young folks coming through. What's your perspective on that? Um, I guess I I kind of touch on three points. One one thing I like about my job is that. I feel like I have the ability, and, and Ernest was my student. I, I can pull a student to the side and just kind of keep it 100 with them. I, I can uh, tell them kind of, hey, you know, you're here um, and you need to be here, right? And that's not always a negative thing, right? Um, even soon, like Ernest, you know, it's, it's always places you can go up. It's always ways you can level up. It's always ways that you can span, expand. And so um, I think what's special about HBCUs is that um, there's this, this intimate community where you can actually sit down with a student and, and hear from them and talk to them and see where they're trying to go and, and expand their mind and, 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 and passions and visions and, and bring opportunities to them. And, and um, I think that's a very special point. The second part is um, we kind of meet students where they are in terms of um, technical abilities. And so um, very important thing, as you, as you all know, is a lot of disparity between the uh, technical abilities at the at the high school level, so students come to Morehouse lots of times at different at different levels. Um, student like Ernest was, you know, you know, really really qualified and, and really strong technically. Where others, you know, they get to college their first day and they're right hello world programs, you know. So um, I think a, you know HBCUs kind of has that that environment that says, hey, you know, we see that you're here. What do you need? You know, saying outside of the classroom in order to to maximize your talent. Um, so I think we HBCUs in general do a pretty good job at that. And I think the opportunities is something that definitely has to be touched on here. Um, a lot of the tech companies have saw HBCUs as this pipeline to their 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 industries. And so I would say that the HBCU student, um, a black that goes to HBCU will have a lot of opportunities because all of these programs and all these special diversity hiring initiatives, they bring to HBCUs. Mm -hmm. If you're not at one, you may not know about them. And so you would actually have a, a lot stronger chance and um, you'll get tons of opportunities from companies. I remember uh, um, at Albany State, it was we had a career fair and it was maybe three booths in the whole career fair that would even look at me as a CS major, right? This is back, you know, um, right around uh, 2000. But, you know, it's just having, uh, but that was a long time ago before the tech, the diversity of tech thing got big, right? Mm -hmm. just, uh, just to be in a situation where you have a lot of opportunities for you, that's half the battle. You know, some students really, if you, if you pick up things late, um, and you start late in computing, having those opportunities for the, for you in your junior and senior year is really important. So it's able, I, I have a company that will come. I can say, hey, I know of a student here. You should talk to him. You know, you should talk to her uh, for the female students that's, that's uh, taking classes from me. So really special experience that um, I think is kind of unique to HBCU. Thank you, uh, Dr. Koshe. And um, I want to go in a, in a interesting uh, direction around identity. So there's a lot of uh, news articles and stories about the trials and tribulations, the challenges of black uh, tech professionals in some of the well-known uh, Silicon Valley tech companies. Um, and it seems to highlight uh, a challenge that African-Americans face in the tech industry. Not that you know, we can't navigate those uh, places and spaces successfully. Obviously, Ernest is doing that as we speak. Um, but I wanted to get your perspective on what has recently emerged as uh, some of these news uh, and press clippings have um, highlighted. And, and some of it has been um, uh, focused on the plight of Black women in particular in tech. So would like to hear your thoughts on that. How, how can we navigate our whole self? Because, you know, it's kind of hard to separate one's um, uh, African-American uh, connections to the community and our identity from who we are as professionals in, in the space. Uh, and then, of course, there's the gender uh, issue as well. Uh, Dr. Pearson, do you want to take a stab at that? Um, 
what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I would love to. to so the 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 story that kind of kicked it off for me was uh, Dr. Tim Neek Gabru, right, and her trials and tribulations Google. Um, and when I when I read her story, that's what actually motivated me to launch um, our new speaker series, "The Future is Intersectional: Black Women Interrogating Technology." Um, and I'll put the link to that speaker series. And actually, Dr. Gabru is going to be our speaker oh, wow. uh, in a couple Great. of weeks. Um, so we're really excited. And also, you know, the story of Erica Shimizu Banks and Ifioma. Ifoma Ozoma at Pinterest, they've already been participants in the speaker series, like really giving voice mm -hmm. to the experiences of Black women in STEM. Because when we talk about um, a lot of the conversations about K-12 computer science makes it sound like if we can just get them to the Googles, then they'll be great from there on, right? And we're not having enough conversations about what happens once you get to the Google. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm sure Ernest can talk more about, you know, that side of the house. But I really feel like on the K-12 and in the higher education spaces, we need to be creating um, computer science students that are critically analyzing computer science, but the tech industry itself. Um, because we need more people like the Gabrus and the banks and the, and the Ozomas who are who are not, so they're not standing out there by themselves, right? So that we, you know, okay, you push one out, there's another one that's just gonna jump in right behind them and take that spot so that eventually the culture begins to shift. Um, but, you know, what we're doing at HBCUs is trying to also kind of position ourselves, right? So Google has now had these conversation with the supposed big HBCUs um, and not to say that someone has to be at every table, but if the big conversations is about black women in computer science and that's the motivation, how do you not have, you know, a college for black women at the table when you're talking to Google about what we should be doing for black women in tech, mm -hmm. right? So it's also, you know, we, I love HBCUs, but we also have some challenges in terms of how we position ourselves and we position our strengths as HBCUs when we're trying to leverage for change, um, at the society level. So I'll just leave it at that. No, well said. And thank you for your, your insights on that. Ernest, you're there, you're, you're, at, you're at the Google. So um, what are your thoughts um, in terms of uh, what you've observed, how you navigate your day-to-day -day as a professional inside of a, a large tech company? <clears throat> yeah, um, I will say it's like started off, like last summer was really hard for a lot of people um, just overall in the world, but then specifically, you know, coming to a meeting where I'm w one of like six out of 600 on my, my personal team at Google, of uh, mm -hmm. my people on my team. Um, <clears throat> and no one's talking about what's happening with like George Floyd or anything else that's a Breonna Taylor or anything, you know? And they're just like, oh yeah, today was like, you know, it was a little cloudy out, but my day's going good. And it's like, how's your day going well right now? How, how are you like functioning um, and just, ignorant to like everything else that's going on in the world and um i think you know everyone has their own experiences and own, own ways of dealing with it but i think that's what makes me even more motivated and passionate about doing the code house work is because um one thing like yes i do always talk about ending up at a place like google or microsoft or twitter like all these big entities uh just because i know what you know a six-figure salary can do for all of these students a lot of their families like a truly change uh, people's lives but it's more about just getting them into the tech industry because of all the different opportunities I'll, I'll be just as satisfied if i help a student out to become a startup founder as as much as a student coming in to um you know work at, at google with me or, or or whatever but it's important um and to build off of other person's point um for people to be these different change makers, to to discover these different issues that happen in tech, whether it's um, way people are are managing their their um, employees, you know, the way they're impacting different communities and environments like HBCUs, um, because there's a lot of ignorance in in tech, you know. There's a lot of smart people and mm -hmm. and people start going down one one path and we've seen it with a lot of these different diversity programs and different um, programs in general and they flop a lot and they think like oh i'm very smart like we're gonna set x y and z um things up and and we're gonna get abc outcomes and it just doesn't happen mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. um 
And one thing I'm a big advocate for is like, you can't just come in and have like white savior conflicts with HBCUs. Like, oh, I'm gonna go over there. We're gonna get recruit all 50 software engineers at Morehouse. And now uh, my company is gonna look great because we, we, we have a great um, relationship with Morehouse. No, like you need to go in there, see some of the, the problems. And I will talk about my, my company because I mean, there's a lot of stuff that we need to work on, but one of the programs I think I most benefited from was the GIR program, Google in Residence, where Google actually comes in and has Google engineers teach at different HBCUs. Um, and now they, even that program needs some work and, <laughs> and um, specifically looking at some of the relationships in the AEC. But uh, I just know that like that is more an investment in, in the community rather than just like, oh, let me just send some recruiters over there and hopefully we'll get some engineers. Like, no, let's put some money and some resources where, where our mouth is and actually help the communities that we want to impact. Um, but clearly, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done um, when it comes yeah. to a lot of these different issues. So it's it's a really hard uh, position to stand in, uh, because especially with some of the people who are in the headlines and are in the clippings, like I know very personally, um, and and I stand with them, and I I'm like, and I know some of the, the issues that they ran in through before everything was let out on the news, and it's just like. Uh, what can I do now to make sure that I am supporting uh, my fellow coworkers or previous coworkers, and at the same time, um, you know, trying to figure out my own journey with, while in the tech industry? So it's, it's a balance between between it all. Well, I, I appreciate both your comments. I want to pivot uh, to the other end of the pipe uh, in the pipeline, and that's K twelve. Uh, we probably could spend a whole day on K twelve. I'll give you my experience. My wife and I co-founded CS for Philly, uh, where I'm from, and we do quite a bit of work around computer science education in the city of Philadelphia. But I've worked in different cities over the course of um, my career in STEM to look at how African Americans are doing, and it's not good. Um, you know, we're structurally bound in underperforming environments that are dysfunctional at best. Um, our systems just basically weren't set up to truly educate folks, let alone in science, technology, engineering, and math. And along comes computer science uh, with an explosion of opportunity, yet misalignment between K-12 higher ed and industry. So there's a major challenge um, facing us uh, who are concerned about the plight of African-American uh, students and young folks who are at the K-12 level. Uh, I should say I'm a very proud board member of Code House, the nonprofit that Ernest and his sister JC have uh, co-founded, and I support their efforts and applaud them uh, for that work. Um, but I know Dr. Gaucher and Dr. Pearson have also done some great work in the city of Atlanta and in other places. So we all in this panel have had our K-12 engagements, and we're all deeply concerned about our community and about our kids. Um, but this is a tough struggle. So I wanted to talk about um that c word which we rarely discuss which is culture and community um how do we as african americans who are in stem uh at you know higher ed or in industry in the case of Ernest, uh working hard to um fulfill the mission how do we get to k-12 in an effective way partner with teachers with schools and even in some cases, school districts who have leaders that are willing and interested in pivoting around the notion that all kids can learn and all kids can be successful, even in computing. How do we, what is it that we need to do uh, to really transform uh, the environment for our kids? And also um, structurally speaking, how do we make the linkage between let's say HBCUs, which have a natural, um, uh, affinity for black students in K-12 because the output of K-12 is the input of higher ed, right? So how do we how do we do that? Um, and how do we do it uh, in a way that's going to impact our community and the belief uh, structures uh, within the minds of our young folks who right now are being steered towards uh, athletics and entertainment? How do we do that? Let me start with uh, you, Dr. Pierce. I want to go into Kenneth because I know you guys have had some promo, and then we'll go to Ernest and JC. Dr. Pearson, what are your thoughts? I get to go first. Um, <laughs> so 
I, I've shifted in terms of my, uh, the way that I think about K-12. I mean, my entire background until coming back to Spelman seven months ago was in K-12 education. So, you know, I feel like I've had a lot of time to, to grapple with what is the problem. Um, and what I'm now seeing is that in terms of when we're talking about like matriculation within computer science, it's a, for me, the, the conversation that I've been having is that we're focusing too much on access and not enough on equity, right? So we, you know, I love a good CS for everybody initiative, um, but we've had math for all forever. We've had, you know, literacy for all forever, but we that is math and reading illiterate. Um, so that just doesn't work. And the larger number of people that you're trying to bring in to, um, a community, if the longer you wait to focus on equity, the harder it's going to be. Because now instead of saying, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna start with a model of equity and then scale that model of equity, it's like, I'm trying to put band-aids on something that was never equitable to begin with. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is when you're talking about trying to kind of steer kids towards computer science, <clears throat> um, we have to first understand ourselves what we are what we are steering them towards. And, and I'm not even talking about what I was saying before around the challenges within the tech industry. I'm talking about, do our classroom teachers truly understand how computer science is a part of every aspect of our society at this point and how to bring that into the classroom? Um, you know, I feel like we're, we're really good at, you know, okay, here's some projects that kind of showcase, you know, how, how technology is being used in this industry. But do we really understand like technology is everywhere, right? So no matter what you are interested in doing, whether you want to be a sociologist or you want to be an engineer, computer science is going to impact the work that you do. Uh, so I like to think about it. I, um, Dr. Ayanna Howard, who's the new um, dean, of engineer, dean of the College of Engineering at Ohio State University, always talks about it in terms of CS plus X, right? We need to stop focusing on CS for CS sakes, there will be some people that just want to be computer scientists. But where we need to shift our focus is the X, right? Like, okay, you want to be a psychologist? How does computer science impact psychology? You know, you want to be a teacher? How does computer science impact? Because it's, as I said before, it's everywhere. And that's how you're going to begin to grow and shift the dynamics of who sees themselves as a computer scientist. Yeah, well said. And uh, by the way, I only choose you first because your box is up <laughs> to the left. You're the first one. Um, I'm not picking on you. Um, but but let's pick up from that thread that Dr. Pearson has uh, introduced. Um, Dr. Gaucher, because I know you've had some uh, interesting experiences in working with uh, teachers at the K-12 level in Atlanta and some other places. What are your thoughts? How do we get to K-12 in a uh, meaningful and sustainable way? Uh, that would allow us to uh, scale impact for African Americans at the K-12 level? Um, I mean, I think everybody here knows about the importance of um, offering CS, edu uh, CS education opportunities. Um, but I want to kind of circle back to what you said, those two C words, culture and community. Um, I remember we uh, I took a tour of the Georgia Tech makerspace a couple years ago. Mm. And, um, there was a guy in there, young guy, and he was asleep with his head in the middle of his project that he was working on. <laughs> and the light bulb went off and I'm like, this young guy, he he understands something that a lot of my Morehouse students don't understand. And because I don't I, I've, I've never seen that in a decade, you know, you know, uh, somebody sleep at the computer because they're just working so hard to pass out. And so yeah. and, and, and Ernest can can definitely kind of talk about this. Uh, there's a culture change that has to happen where our students have to learn that it's not about, okay, I go to school, I get good grades, I pass and I am successful. Computing is really about skills and developing skills and practicing and, and using technology and using tools and solving problems. It's not just about grades. Grades don't, uh, grades only go so far in computing compared to other places. And so we really have to build a community that supports actual learning of skills and actually doing of things and um, and getting things done, accomplish things and having projects and solving problems and explorations and seeing things through and 
and hey, I mean, you know, I, I might have to pull this all night or I might have to, you know, make these sacrifices because I got to really get in here and learn this stuff, I, you know. So it, it's a whole culture change that starts with at home where it's not just about the grades you bring home. Um, what are you learning? What are you doing? Because mm -hmm. um, what happens is that students will come to a school and it happens at every school. Um and they just figure out the, the path of least resistance, right? I know I need to graduate. I need a certain GPA. So let me take the easiest classes possible. Let me take the teachers that are going to be the less rigorous. And 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 what happens is on the back end, there's, there's, there's consequences and repercussions of that, right? When you go into your technical interview and somebody gives you this white, white, white erase marker, dry erase mm -hmm. marker, and you got to put down what you know. And at that point, if you, you know, cut corners the whole four years, you're going to end up um, suffering the consequences. So I just, I think our students need to know that coming into college. Um, I think it's really critical at the K-12 to, to kind of inspire these students and let them know um, that so that when they do get to college and they do start these uh, degrees of computing, they can maximize them. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, let me go to Ernst and then uh, JC because uh, you guys have been doing great work with Code House and I'm sure uh, your own uh, personal in interests and efforts. Uh, Ernest, talk to us about your experiences as the co-founder of Code House and somebody who's been engaging K-12 students. What, what makes the difference for them and what have you seen as best practices? Yeah, um, and I know <laughs> JC Duffin has a lot to say on this as well. Um, it, it all started just with the concept of just getting these students exposed to people that look like them that were successful within the field, right? Like what happens when middle and high school students meet a black UI UX designer at Twitter or um, a software engineer at Google or program manager at Microsoft, right? And get to talk to them, you know? Um, we started off with an event back in 2019, had 150 students come not only meet these professionals of color from all these major institutions and organizations, but then also HBCU students. And I think there was something magical that was happening when the students were able, the K-12 students were able to engage and connect with not only HBCU students from the UC, but then also the industry professionals, try out things like the HoloLens and like, oh wow, you actually work on this? Like, how, how does this work, right? and um, get to hear um, these professional stories and how they got into tech and why they think it's so important for these stu young students to come to tech. And we, we started leaving every event with students actually reaching out to myself, co-founder Tavis Thompson, to JC, um, saying like, like, that event was so dope. I can't wait for next time. Like, I want to do computer science. I want to go to Morehouse now. And that's what really spun us up into making Codehouse into a full 501c3 because we just realized the kind of impact it was having on these students. We recently just had an event with Facebook where we taught students how to code, like block based coding, um, but through beat making, right? Um, partnered with another organization called Hip Hop for Change over in Oakland. And literally, they were making beat ciphers, um, so bringing the hip hop into there, but also learning um, basic functionality like, like loops. And I think showing students that like coding can be engaged with our culture. Um, there's people that look like them within this field is super, super important because it makes it more realistic. It makes it more tangible for these students. So then when they do get access to the CS educational program, it's like, all right, well, I kind of got exposed through, through this one event. Let me give it a shot. Because like a lot of students are intimidated by it, but that's because they don't think that they have a community here to support them. And that's exactly the work that we're trying to do with Code House. Uh, JC? Yeah. Oh, I have a lot to say on this. Um, okay. I am in a unique situation where at Spelman College, I'm housed in the arts and visual culture department. I'm working on a major interactive media and minor the interactive media that intersects art and computer science. So I'm teaching computer science concepts to artists. Uh, I've been at Spelman since August 2020. And I teach a class called Creative Coding. And the first thing that I do on the first day of class with these students is I put a, uh, on mural boards, if anyone uses them, I put a line. And on one side of the line, there's a zero. And on the other side of the line is the 10. And I ask them the question, on a scale of one to 10, how confident are you in your math and computer science abilities? 
and without fail, these are art majors, they go zero, negative 10, negative 25, negative infinity. They do not believe in themselves when they first start my class. I have not had a student go higher than I believe five. Uh, and so these students, I think, no matter what level you are at, the most important thing that you can acquire is confidence. We need to, in, what's it called? Give our students the confidence to pursue these subjects. We were just in conversations, Bauman College was in conversation with the founder of Afrotechtopia. It is a conference that happens in New York City uh, for artists and creatives and technologists to come together to collaborate on different art projects. Addie Melenciano is the founder and I asked her about her relationship with coding. She was a trained artist. She went to University of Maryland for undergrad, did not go to an HBCU, did not take computer science classes before she got to grad school. Uh, where we were grad students together at NYU's interactive telecommunications program. And she had the very profound insight that it is a marathon. It's just not a sprint. She took several coding classes before she got it. But because of the teachers that we had when we were in grad school, we gained confidence. Uh, and that is the most important thing that a teacher can do for any student, to give them the confidence to continue pursuing. They might not walk out of your class, especially in younger grades, middle school, elementary school, knowing what for loops are, what functions are, knowing you know all of the theory that they need to know in the world of computer science. But if they walk out of your class with confidence to keep taking classes, to keep pursuing the subject, that is the most important thing that you can do for your students. In New York, I was a instructor. Um, uh, a summer instructor for Girls Who Code, and I also sat on their curriculum advisory board. And I think the most important thing that I learned while serving on that board was teaching growth mindset to students, showing them that things are possible. If they don't get it now, they need to keep trying again. And that is the best thing that we can do for any of our teachers. Um, I'm looking in the chat and I'm seeing some questions about curriculum support. I'm just gonna throw out a few. Khan Academy has some really great resources for teachers in K through 12 that are interested in teaching AP computer science principles or any computer science classes for students who are on their own. Code Academy has some great resources. If students, uh, if you know that your students are more inclined for art and code, there is a really great YouTube channel called The Coding Train. Uh, this is a YouTube channel that teaches art and code uh, using a plat platform called P5JS. This is what I teach in my classes. Um, so those are just some resources for people in the chat who are asking. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, if we want to see um, what I think, especially with Code House, talking to teachers, especially in, in Georgia and in other districts and other states, we need resources for computer science teachers. They need resources. I have talked to so many teachers who were talking about how last year, and this is in a true in our even our own school district, uh, one of the computer science teachers was a PE teacher the year before. Uh, we've seen teachers who were like, I was teaching history or English, or I have a degree in you know subject X, but now I'm being thrown into computer science and that's heartbreaking. So finding resources for these teachers. And again, I'm going to say Khan Academy, Code Academy have some great resources. Um, I think, Ernest, you know of a few others that we've um, shared with our Code House networks, but getting resources for those teachers. Um, I talked about Girls Who Code. Uh, they have curriculum, and you can reach out to Girls Who Code to find curriculum for if you wanted to start a Girls Who Code chapter in your school. They also have curriculum for the summer program that I believe is accessible to anyone who might ask for it, right? So finding resources resources for teachers is the most important thing that we can do. Thank you, Ernest, for finding the coding train. Excellent. Well, we're going to uh, pivot towards the uh, Q&A um, and would offer the uh, opportunity for folks who have been listening to this great panel uh, to ask questions and uh, put, them, put their questions in the chat and I can read them out. But there was an excellent question uh, by Kathalina Mons concerning uh, the availability of, um, I guess, uh, uh, options for uh, K-12 students interested in computer science education outside of the traditional public school setting, homeschoolers, learning pods, et cetera. Can you all speak to that? Um, I don't know who wants to take that question, but um, uh, help us uh, uh, guide uh, Kathleen Mons in the right direction. Yeah, I think Ernest mentioned hype as a really good resource in terms of summer programming. I'll say Girl, Girls Who Code Again is another good summer program outside of the standard curriculum. 
Uh, Code Academy is, um, again, self-paced. Uh, Codeo also has self-paced courses um, for outside of the traditional K through 12. Khan Academy's curriculum can definitely be used for homeschooling. Uh, and I'm seeing Catherine just mentioned Gen Cyber as well. Excellent. Um, let me see if there are any other questions. I'll, I'll ask a question, uh, moderator's privilege. Um, if we're looking at sustaining these kinds of efforts um, where higher ed, HBCUs in this case, can engage K-12, what are some of the things that we ought to be looking at in terms of long-term engagement? Uh, and I'm thinking, you know, uh, school systems to HBCU, uh, faculty to teacher kind of relationships, par partnerships and collaborations. I'm going to give a stab. I, I don't know if I'm going to actually answer the question you asked, but um, <laughs> what I'm what I'm thinking about in relation to that is um, helping K-12 broaden their understanding of what computer science is beyond coding. Um, <laughs> so you know, K-12 is always a little bit behind where industry is and. And I remember having a conversation when I was at Georgia Tech with a faculty member who was talking about like coding is going to be the new factory job, right? Like if we're if all we're doing is preparing students to code, we are essentially preparing the next set of fact of factory workers, right? And so if we really are seeing computer science as like you know um, opportunity for for social and capital gain then we have to broaden our understanding of computer science and think about and also kind of open our eyes a bit to where the funding comes from that supports technological development right the majority of funding comes from the department of defense so we have to think about okay what are the what are the needs of the department of defense related to technology and how can we help to diversify that so i'm thinking about things like cybersecurity i'm thinking about things like quantum science right like where is the next wave and how are we helping our students to understand like coding is great and it's a great foundation and computer science is much bigger than mm. that no it's a it's a very good uh, answer thank you uh, there's a question from Chelsea Roebuck uh, to uh, uh, wanted to jump in. Oh, I'm sorry, Ernest. Go yeah, I, I was gonna because I, I love what you're talking about of on uh, Dr. Pearson on, you know, um, like computer science, great skill that I think everyone needs to learn. Um, definitely is going to be fundamental for everyone to <laughs> to realize um, and to have ingrained in their curriculum. Um, there is another conversation we've had recently just talking about how computer science um, can get you a job for it and that is technically your side hustle, you know, pay the rent, you know, make your money. But uh, I think one thing, especially going to HBCUs taught me like everyone has like their main hustle and their side hustle, right? So like for instance, like me right now, Code House, even though we don't really care ourselves in Code House, that's my side hustle. But that's just something I'm very passionate about. But all my friends that work in tech right now, they're working at these big institutions, but a lot of them are working on side projects, you know, their own startup ideas, their own nonprofits, their own um, engaging activities. And I think that's also a big point to talk about um, how, yes, getting a job at Google can provide you to a lot of equity for yourself. You know, you get the stock, the bonus, the salary. Yeah, that's great. Cool. Also, you're building up your skill base. You're learning a lot at, at these organizations. But also think about your own plan. Like, what are you getting into for yourself? Like, do you see yourself working at Google for the next few years? If so, that's great. You know, that that's your decision. Um, that's what you want to do. But also be thinking about like entrepreneurship. Think about other programs that you can start up and and just start creating things for your own and for your own community. I, I think that's just a big point to make sure to to speak on. All very good points. Um, there's a question from uh, Chelsea Roebuck directed to uh, JC and Dr. Pearson. Uh, can you talk more about CS plus X or CS for what? And why is it important for all students to learn computer science? Uh, JC, do you want to tackle that first? Yes. Um, 
interdisciplinary collaboration is the way of the future. And Dr. Pearson talked to this point a, a little bit about how, you know, coding could easily be the next factory uh, job. Mm -hmm. But when we pair computer science with different disciplines, when we pair it specifically, I would always say uh, project based application with entrepreneurship, giving students uh, the teaching students how to create for themselves, teaching students how to explore their interests, using computer science not as a, a, a theoretical entity that they must explore and dissect, but as a creative tool or as a tool for creative research or creative practice or exploration or innovation. Uh, that is really the way of the fu future. Getting students to be passionate about the things that they're working on, uh, remember at the end of the day is not, oh, I learned what a for loop is or what an if statement is. It's more of, we want to show students, I created this cool thing that now has an impact in the real world. Or I saw how using computer science allowed me to create this thing that allowed me to engage with these different subjects. Um, so really approaching CS, not again, as just an entity on its own, but as a creative tool or as a tool for you know innovation, uh, that's what I'm seeing the future is. Uh, at Microsoft, um, I worked at Microsoft for two years as a product manager. And even though I needed CS training in order to land that job, my work, I was not coding every day. That was not my role. I was working with engineers and designers all day to come up with new features that would go into existing Microsoft products, right? Uh, so there's a ton of different career paths out there that don't just use computer science. They need this idea of computer science plus something else or this computer science, or they use computer science as a tool or as a language in which you can communicate with other people, but you also need to pair it with different skill, skills in order to create new things for the world. Um, and so that's really what in my classrooms, in, in the work that we're doing with Code House, where we teach them about the different career paths and the different types, um, areas of computer science, that's what we're showing students, um, and I think is the most beneficial. I'm going to give the chance for Dr. Pearson to step in about CS Plex X. Great, JC. <clears throat> um, the only thing I would add is, and, you know, I've been on this kind of, maybe because of the work I'm doing, I've been on this kind of how do we save ourselves <laughs> kick lately in terms of the role. I put in the chat two films that I think are really important um, that teachers can, can share with their students and have conversations with their students. One is Coded Bias, um, which just aired on PBS on Monday, I think it was, um, but it's the work of Joy Bullamwini, who's a grad student at MIT, who does a lot of work with Dr. Gabru. Um, around facial recognition and how facial recognition is being used to margin continuously marginalize communities of color. Um, and, you know, really working on how do we make sure that those who are creating the future, right, have people that are thinking about communities of color when they're creating that future. So that's one. The second is The Social Dilemma, which is on Netflix, which talks about, you know, algorithmic bias again, right, and talking about how social um, specifically social media is created to create an addictive culture, right, that is kind of um, and how they've kind of commodified social media in a way that keeps people engaged and um, entertained. Um, and so both of those are really good ways to help students to understand the importance of computer science in multiple aspects of our society so that they can then see where they fit in, right? The research shows that, you know, students of color become interested in computer science when they see how it can help them to um, contribute to their community, right? And so both of these films are specifically talking about how computer science is being used to harm communities of color. So therefore we need more people that are actually actively engaged in that work. Excellent, excellent. I think we have time for maybe one more uh, question. Um, let me see if I can, there's a question. Uh, Really quickly, I'm seeing a question from German Vargas about yeah, um, <laughs> the after school yeah. programs are great, but may present an issue of self selection. So, what can we do in our classrooms? I think that really speaks back to what we were talking about. Um, a few things that you can do, especially at the K through 12 um, level, if you have any groups for specific minorities, whether it's like an African American club or a you know different types of groups, you can partner with them to come up with their for a, a two hour half 
hackathon or to go into those different clubs or classrooms to talk about um, opportunities in tech to advertise different classes that are being taught at your school. In the classroom itself, this is an opportunity to show different examples uh, of where computer science is used. Show them, you know, game development and show them how computer science is being used to create the games that they play or show them how computer science and music can come together. Um, into like to create weird, you know, interactive music experiences, show them, um, you know, different opportunities or different examples of projects that have been created uh, to get them interested. When students have an idea of something that they want to create, that's when the passion kicks in. That's when they're going to spend the time to really understand the concepts in order to create the idea. Uh, in my classrooms, we always lead with um, project-based assignments where students are, are given a task of saying, you know, uh, animate a video game character using code or um, what's it called? One student really wanted to make uh, an animation of a gumball machine. Uh, and so she spent hours trying to understand physics and game engines in order to get the physics for the gumballs to fall out at the right time. Um, so showing them example projects is a really great way to speak to a lot of students' interests and different variety. Um, but then also partnering with school clubs that are already um Tar targeting or catering to diverse demographics, partnering with them for a day to talk about computer science is another great way to show students that this is something that's for them. Well, thank you, JC. Uh, that was exactly the question I was going to point to. Um, that's a good way to close this panel out. Let me say thank you uh, and much appreciation for our panelists, uh, Dr. Tamara Pearson at Spelman College, uh, Ernest Holmes, who's a software engineer at Google, uh, Dr. Kenneth Gaucher, who's a computer science uh, faculty member at Morehouse College, and J.C. Holmes, who's a faculty member at Spelman College. Thank you to all of you for sharing your insights and perspectives, and I know that, uh, that everyone in the audience got a lot out of this conversation. Wish you all the very best and a pleasant rest of the day. Thank you.